I have a message this morning that is a it's a it's a message of encouragement. Uh, it's also a message of correction, and you decide where it fits for you. Is that all right? Uh, I'm not going to pick you out. I'm just going to pick on you. I'm just going to speak the word and let the word deal with you, and let it deal with me as it's supposed to. Amen. So let me let me speak to you what the Lord spoke to me. He said, "America, your days are numbered. Your purpose is being fulfilled." And you're not even aware of your assignment. I am moving you closer to that day. A day of reckoning. A day of recompense. Do you not know the scriptures? Have you forgotten the prophecies? The hooks of war are drawing you closer to that day. But why would you care? You rely on pride and pomp to fuel your foolish ambitions while the core of your nation is rotting. Your collapse is near, but my glory is nearer. I will have a glorious church, baptized in fire and infused with my fearless love. My church is armed and dangerous, and no place of darkness is beyond her reach. Heavenly Father, thank you for this message today as pointed as it will be. I thank you for grace. I thank you for love. I thank you for the ability to articulate it. I thank you for changing, Father, the words for the hearer, for their life, so that they can run with it, that it will be tangible to them, Father. I thank you for the anointing of the Holy Ghost and ask that you hide me behind the cross. Let everybody remember the name of Jesus, and may they forget mine and forget the name of this church. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. The title of this message is called Armed and Dangerous. Armed and Dangerous. Uh, I encourage you to go back and listen to the, the prophetic word there about the severity of the hour that we're living in. And again, there's no doubt about it. I wouldn't get in the parking lot and fight you and get into a fist fight over the hour that we're living in. Uh, it's pretty obvious. Unless you spent the last couple years upside in a post hole, uh, you know, you, you ought to know what time it is. And it's not getting any better. Let me try that again. It's not getting any better, and it's not supposed to get any better according to the Word of God. Because when it's time for the unraveling of time itself, it will be chaotic, and it will be full of crisis and turmoil and tribulation. It'll be a time of testing and trial for every one of us. Nobody in this room is exempt. Let me try that again. Nobody is exempt from the pressures of life. We all deal with them, whether you have slick hair, shiny shoes, or just a slick head. Come on, somebody. Uh, a microphone or no microphone, you still are subject. You'll get over that one. You're su- subject to the problems of life. I wish there was an island or a bubble you could go on and get in to protect yourself from what's happening, but you can't except to be in Christ. And even in him, you're going to feel pressures. But greater is he that's in you than he that's in this world. And so this message, Armed and Dangerous, is speaking to the body of Christ in a world that's gone crazy, in a world that's gone chaotic, it's gone mad, when people that you once knew used to be stable have lost their minds. Come on, somebody. The people used to sit next to you no longer sit next to you. They're out in the world somewhere, and they've given up on God, or they're stuck to a YouTube channel. Come on now, memorizing prophecy rather than memorizing Scripture. Come on, somebody. And because of that, we have a weak, anemic church, if you will, impotent in the ways of evangelism and world missions and everything that God wants us to do in this final hour. So we're going to try to fix that today and bring us to a place of where we need to be, and that is armed and dangerous. I don't know about you, but I'm wanted. I said, I'm a wanted man today. I'm armed and I'm dangerous. Not that I've got weapons on me. Come on, somebody. Uh, But I'm armed with the power of God. I said, I'm armed with the power of God. I'm armed with righteousness and unholiness and consecration unto God. I'm, I'm sanctified. Come on, filled with the Holy Ghost and love God with all my heart, all my spirit, all my soul, all my mind. I have no ulterior motives. 
I didn't say I was Peter Perfect. I'm being worked on, but greater is the one that lives inside of me. So I'm armed and dangerous today. So let's get down to business. Romans chapter 13. Go to Romans chapter 13. I'll preach this to you in a way you may have never heard it before. And you need to see the progression here. I am one that brings about the word through progression. I want you to see what God is saying in order to get to the climax of where we're headed. And so just pick, picking out a few scriptures. Is that all right? Romans chapter 13. We're going to begin in verse 1. So we heard the prophetic word that God is putting a hook in the jaws of America and the nations. And by the way, if you don't know what's happening in Ukraine right now, you're not a follower of the Bible you're not a listener of the prophetic reality. You're watching Ezekiel 38 begin in infancy as God is allowing the hooks to be put in the jaws of nations, and one of the biggest jaws is ours. And you're going to see some stuff in the coming days. So it's very exciting. But watch this, verse 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. How many souls? Everybody. Everybody be subject unto the higher powers. All right, that sounds pretty good. And one thing I want you to understand that the key to kingdom power is subjection. The key to all power, the key to all power in, in the kingdom of God is subjection, to be under authority. You can never be in authority unless you're under authority. Come on now, who gave you the authority? You have to be underneath authority and subjected to that authority, and then the authority comes to you. It's delegated to you. One of the problems we have in the American church is the mindset is I'm an island unto myself, and I can do what I want to do, pastor. Come on, somebody. I can do what I want to do, preacher man. I can do and live the way I want to live because I'm free. I was born free. I'm going to die free. Come on now. But the reality is you're free by truth. Truth sets you free and truth keeps you free. And as a believer, my subjection is unto God first, then unto man. But if I don't follow the guidelines that God has ordained, then I'm going to find myself in opposition with not only man, but with God. Watch this now. I'm establishing something here because the reality of the church is we are by nature rebellious. More so in America because we were born in rebellion. I don't have time to go back and take you into history, but there's no doubt about it. We were rebellious against the crown. We were rebellious against England. We didn't want to be kept underneath sub subjection. And in one case, that's a good thing. In another case, it can be damaging to us. Because then we have a problem between understanding our relationship with God. Come on, you're looking at me like a calf staring at a new gate, and it's the truth. And because we have that improper belief and bringing up in life, we don't understand and respect the authority of who God is. Watch this. I'm going to prove to you because Paul is laying this out for us very perfectly. Let every soul be subject to the higher powers, for there's no power but of God. He said there's no authority. If you don't like power in the King James, it means there's no authority. Authority is the structure of power and the enforcer of power. Let me try that again. Authority is the structure and the enforcer of power. In other words, God establishes things in a way and in a reason that there would be structure within it in order for there to be execution of what he wants done. Now, we know this in civil law. We know this in civil authorities and governmental authorities. But it is the same principle and aspect when it comes to the house of God, that God has order. Come on, somebody. He has order and he has divine structure. And within that structure, he has enforcement. And as we apply that authority and as we obey that authority, then God begins to bless us in the realm of his kingdom and begins to give us authority and dominion in it. In other words, we can't be a free willy and do what we want to do and tell God to bless it. 
That's what a lot of preachers do when they get up on Sunday morning as they preach what headquarters tells them to preach, and they're outside of the structure and the will of God, but they're perfectly in the structure of the denomination. And therefore, they get the results of a denomination and no results of a kingdom. Come on now. And they get the blessings and the letters and the medals and the pictures and all the plaques from the bishop, but they don't get the blessings and the authority and the goodness and promotion from the bishop of all bishops. Is anybody here? I would rather have the power and the blessings of an almighty God than some bishop with a long coat, come on now, and a long face with a big old dirty beard telling me how wonderful I am. Because I've got a bunch of uh, youngins in the children's ministry or whatever they do. You know, the little sign in the back there. We've had 44 this week. Yay! 44 dead people. Come on, somebody. Big deal. Ain't got no life, but you got a number in the back on a little wooden sign. Y'all ain't been in church in a long time. Come on now. Don't make fun of that. I'm not, you know, listen, whatever, man. If that floats your boat and if you just look at that number and that turns you on, hey, go for it. We ain't going to find it here. I don't care about numbers. I want to see people change. I want to hear testimonies like Brother Curtis said. I want to hear testimonies about what we're hearing. I, I want the phone to ring and say, hey, we're here to bless you. I ain't trying to dial for dollars. Help us over here, please. We're going under. No, honey, we want to bless we want to be a storehouse. Give. Why? Because it's been freely given unto us. And if God can get it through you, God will get it to you. Woo, hallelujah. He can get it through this church. We're givers. We bless. We love. We want to see our community bless. I want to see the nations of the world bless. Why? I'm armed and I'm dangerous. I'm not hiding behind a skirt. I'm not hiding behind a board, a denomination. Come on now. I'm armed and I'm dangerous. Watch this. Watch this. For there is no power but of God, and the powers that be are ordained of God. So in other words, God has made this structure of power. Now, if I want power, i got to stay in the structure. Whosoever therefore resists the authority or the power resists the ordinance of God. So in other words, if I go against the things of, of, of the laws of nature or the laws of civil, or the laws of government, the laws of life, the laws of earth, if I go against them, then I'm violating the laws of heaven. Now, we're all going to break law, but we don't intentionally do it. In other words, we're not going out to intentionally commit crime. At least I don't know how many you are in here, but come on now. It says 55, and we're doing 65. Come on, somebody. I'm looking at Brother Ronnie. I don't know why. I'm just looking at Brother Ronnie. Come on, somebody. The sign said yield, and we said go. <laughs> There's things we do. I get it. We're not talking about a microscope type of law. But what we're doing is we're saying, Lord, I obey the laws the best that I can because I understand that there are no laws, there's no structure, there's no authority, there's no power outside of you because you ordained it. And I'm not supposed to resist it. Why? Because it's going to be good for me. Watch this now. And you have to teach this again. It's elementary because we're living in a time of great rebellion in the house of God. We got people that think we're going to take this nation by storm with a musket. Come on now. With a, with a, with a Davy Crockett hat. How'd that work out for them? Come on now. I'm armed and dangerous, but I don't need a 300 blackout. I don't need an AR-15. I don't, I don't need those things because that's not my weaponry. My weaponry is the power of God. The power of prayer. Get on my knees. Watch this. I'm getting ahead of myself. The power of God. The powers that be ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resists the power, resists the orders of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Hello, January 6. Hello, Patriot Church. Hello, Nationalist Church. Hello, folks. Is anybody here? There's people that are sitting in a jail cell right now because they thought in the name of Jesus they're going to take over the Capitol. How'd that work out? 
and ain't nobody bailing them out. Everybody they supposedly were supporting are making millions of dollars while you sitting in the jail cell. And we still got people and pastors standing up in pulpits all across America, thundering and hollering and screaming and spitting and sputtering about their rights and what they want to do. Instead of preaching this blessed gospel to the nations of the earth and let God deal with these things. Let God deal with unrighteousness and stay and live within the structure that you got. That doesn't mean I don't vote the fools out. That doesn't mean I don't. Come on, somebody. That doesn't mean I don't try to bring about change. I do everything I possibly can. But my goal is not to rearrange a structure that God has already put in place through violence or through rebellion. I do it the right way. And if God don't change it, then there's a reason for it. See, we get the leadership we deserve. Ah, uh, nobody helping me now. We get the leadership, not the one you voted in and wished for. You get the leadership in your life you deserve. You get the bed you made up. You lie in what you've done. If you sow to the wind, you're going to get what? You're going to get the whirlwind. Whatsoever a man soweth, a man's going to reap. If the nation is sowing lasciviousness and craziness and homosexuality and all the other transgender and all the other isms of life, what do you think we're going to reap? That's exactly what we're getting today. That's gone to root. It's gone to seed. Ain't got no preachers got a backbone to talk about it because they want everybody to be friends. They want to be pastor popular. I don't want to be popular. I'm not popular. I don't look popular. I don't sound popular. I just want to preach Christ and go home. Come on, some of this. This ain't my home. I won't go to the house. I'm not talking about my house down the road. I want to go to my heavenly house when the Lord says it's time to go. But I'm going to finish this thing, and I want to direct some, uh, some havoc on the enemy because I'm armed and I'm dangerous. You ought to say that to yourself. You ought to walk around your house and say, I'm armed and I'm dangerous. Come on now. I'm armed and I'm dangerous. I'm armed and I'm dangerous. Now, we don't do that today in the pansy church. Oh, that's violent words, Pastor. Can we just love each other? Well, I'm going to talk to you about love in a minute. But the love the world wants you to have is pacifist love. They, they want you to, to lay down and let people walk on you and you don't do nothing and say, oh, well, that wasn't God's will. I guess it's God's will for all this to go to hell in a handbasket. Well, it may be his will to deal with the nations of the world, but it's not his desire that anybody go to hell. So I'm going to work on the anybody and somebody. Hopefully that somebody will come to Christ. I'm not going to give up and play dead. Are you all you here today? All right, I want to make sure you're all still good. Got a pulse. Whosoever sort of therefore resists the power, resists the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. What you worried about what's going on in Washington for? If you're doing what you're supposed to do, what you worried about? We spend more time and more money. I'm preaching now. More time and more money in the American church today dealing in politics rather than preaching this truth to the 1040 windows and the regions of the world where they've never heard of Jesus Christ. There are places in the world today they've never heard of Jesus Christ. And you've heard his name a trillion times. Come on. And we spend more money on that focus of political entities hoping, watch us to have a better world to live on so we can act more dead inside the house of God and do nothing for Christ. To be truthful, the church grows and the church moves and the church functions the best under pressure and persecution. Read your Bible. Read church history. Find out about revival. When revival really breaks out, it breaks out during persecution. It breaks out when times are bad. It breaks out when there's evil leadership. It breaks out when there's pressure to the left and pressure to the right. And there's, there's all kinds of apostate people around. Study history. It's true. That's why it's happening now in spots and places. Because we're matching the atmosphere where the cold and hot coming together makes a good thunderstorm. Come on, somebody, and bring some rain. And we're getting refreshed in certain places. But that refreshing is not for us to hang around and glow, as I said last week. It's so that we could be empowered to go. Go into the nations. Go into the world. Go to your neighbor. How about this? Why don't you go to your family member? You don't have to get on a boat or a barge or a plane to travel to the mission field. Your mission field's right down aisle seven in Walmart. 
You want to go to a foreign nation? Go to Walmart. <laughs> Baby, you can find aliens. If you don't believe in aliens, you ain't been to Walmart lately. Go there about, about 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock at night. In fact, you only know what time it is because people got pajamas on all the time anyways when they go in there. Yeah, you want a mission field, you just go right there. <laughs> people tell you, Pastor, I don't want to go to the plane. I don't want to get on a train. I don't want to get on a boat. I don't want to go overseas. I don't want to do all these things. Well, go right down the road. Find your neighbor. Get you some of the squash back there and take some squash and have a squash meeting. Get you some food. Do something. Get a lawnmower this, this spring and start mowing somebody's yard and watch them have a heart attack on the front yard, front lawn. You think I'm crazy? People would just say, what are you? They'll probably chase you off, but what are you doing? Well, man, I'm loving you. I'm serving you. Servanthood Christianity. Man, we're miss, missing. The church has become a cesspool. It's become a whore in the sense of come give me instead of giving out and saying, let me give you life. Let me give you hope. Let me give you what God gave me. Freely I've received, so freely I'm going to give to you. What are we going to do? Hoard up a bunch of squash in the back and watch it get full of maggots? Come on, somebody. And all messed up and ruined. What are we going to do with the stuff? Give it away. See, this is what, I, this is okay. This is what I don't understand about everybody pre-tribulation rapture folk. And, and that's fine. That's who you are. I got friends and, you know, we can disagree and it's all good. But my thing is, why are you holding on to all the stuff you have? Just give it away. If you're blasting off and you're going off somewhere, what are you holding on to that Bentley for? Let's sell that booger, man. Let's preach the gospel. Let's tell everybody about the end times. If you really believe the rapture can happen at any time, why do you hold on so tightly? You ought to live loosely. Reminds me of that old 80s song, hold on loosely. You just let it go, man. Just total, just disregard. But no, they ain't going to do no, pal, I got, I got to have this, pastor, you know. No, 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 if you really believed it, so why are you holding on to it? You know, I haven't had one person send me one title deed to their house yet that believes in the rapture, brother. Uh, no, nobody sent me their car title yet. Nobody sent me the deed to their property, Sarah. Nobody sent me their 401K. No one has put me in a wheel. I don't understand that if we really believe something, so I'm willing to believe what I believe, that I'm putting my mouth where my money is and my money where my mouth is, and my heart is going to the nations of the world. Come on now, and we're doing what we need to do because we recognize, watch this, no man's promise tomorrow. So you worried about someday rapture when I'm worried about the man that's about to blow his brains out or the person that's going to die by the time I finish preaching this message and go to eternity without Christ. See, we got it all wrong. We got it all wrong because we're not subjected unto the authority of God. No, 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 we're not. We're following a preacher. We're following what he says, a denomination, what a church structure says is truth. No, I want to follow the word. I appreciate my preacher friends over my life and my, my senior pastors and my elders and mentors and, and fathers in the faith. But I, if they don't follow the faith that I'm believing in in this word right here, we just got to cut ways for a little bit. Are you here? But there's people that are stuck listening to me right now that are so stuck in traditional churches, we, we couldn't get you out with a jackhammer. Oh, that didn't go over too good. We, we'd call fire and you say, what? The house is on fire, huh? You know I'm telling you the truth. Get mad at a hornet listening to me. But you know it's the truth. That's why you keep listening. For, ruler, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. So what am I worried about? I'm not worried about it. I'll do my part. I'll do my civil duty. But I'm not worried about them. See, my enemy is not flesh and blood. My enemy is the devil. My enemy is powers and principalities and powers. My enemy is not the, is not the Democrats. My enemy is not the Republicans. My enemy is not the independents, and I don't know who I is. My enemy is the enemy, which is the devil, the stealer of all souls. I'm after him. I'm armed and dangerous. I'm after him. I'm not looking to fight you over politics. 
That's funny. We fight about politics and they make all the money. (laughs) They're golfing, hanging out with each other, drinking martinis. Come on now. And you squeeze as much tea out of that tea bag as you possibly could. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever had reused tea bags? I have. Just squeeze that puppy to there. Ain't nothing left. How do you like your grinds or your grounds or whatever you're drinking? For they're not terrors for good work, but deal. Will thou then not be afraid of the power? Look what he's teaching us here. I'm headed somewhere with this. Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. So I'm not looking over my shoulder for black helicopters. Some got it, some didn't. I'm not looking and worried about the enemy spying on me. First of all, if you spy it on me, you're going to be bored. I remember when the big thing came out about the NSA listening to our cell phones. You know what I did? I started praying in tongues. Here you go, bro. Interpret that. Come on. My life is boring. They're going to either quit their job or they're going to take, I don't know what they're going to do, but they they, probably get a good night's sleep. I'm not up to, I'm up to good. I didn't say I was perfect. I didn't say I'd do everything right, but I'm up to good. So why worry? But we got paranoia in the house of God. We got people are schizophrenic. We got people, and I'm not making fun of anybody that's dealing with anything like that. I'm just saying that's the way the church is, man. We don't one minute we're for God, and in a minute the devil's going to kill us, and the government's going to re- look. That time will come when they will persecute you and put you away. That time will come. It's getting to that point. We recognize that. It's already happening to our brothers and sisters worldwide. We got that. But why am I going to be afraid to do what I'm supposed to do if what I'm doing is in the context of the authority of God? I'm in his government. Now, I know the civil government and other governments don't do what they're supposed to do, but they're still ordained of God because he put it there. Could you imagine if we didn't have proper government? Anybody heard of Portland? I love my Portland friends. we got people who support us that are there. We love them. But other places where they want to abandon the law enforcement. Are you insane? How's that working out for you? 911. Hello? Hello? <laughs> Sorry, this number's been disconnected. Could you imagine that? That's insanity. But yet there's people that don't want government in their lives, and it's absolutely insanity, and it's church folk too. Now, I understand. Don't get me wrong. People are going to write me letters with their crayons, getting all mad at me. I absolutely understand the evils of government because anytime you have a man touching anything, it's messed up. The guard was great till man got there. Somebody help me. Government's fine. It's a great structure. God ordained it, but it gets messed up when you put people in there. But it's still his structure. And I have to follow what God wants me to follow in structure and in line with his word. So don't, I don't want to go too far on either side. I think you're mature enough to know where I'm coming from. If not, we'll talk in the parking lot. Will thou then be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have the praise of the same. For he is a minister of God. To who? For you, for your good. Watch this now. God has ordained them and made them ministers so that we would do good. Don't you recognize and realize that when you're driving down the road and you see officer friendly in your rear view mirror, all of a sudden your foot, come on now, begins to do some twitching and then there's tightening. Y'all figure that part out. Come on now. And then all of a sudden you're right in line. 40, come on now. 49.5 and a 55. And then he passes you. Mm, okay, yeah. Come on, you know. Huh? They ain't doing nothing wrong, but you see Officer Friendly, you see, you see him behind you, all things, things change, don't it? Why? That's authority. That's God's minister. <laughs> well, I'll just show him. Uh-huh. 
Uh, my daddy told me one time, he said, son, you may about outrun the first cop, the first officer, but you can't outrun his radio. So I slowed down. But if thou do which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is a minister of God, avenger, a revenger, to execute wrath upon them that doeth evil. So we know that government is there to do what it's supposed to do, to keep us in check and to keep us in line and all those different things. Wherefore, you must needs be subject. In other words, the Ben Faircloth translation is you better be. I said you better be. You better be. If you see them blue lights come on you, pull over, please. Put both hands on the wheel. Shut that vehicle off. Don't fiddle around with your phone looking for something. And please don't put your hand under the seat. And don't reach to the glove department to get your wallet. Just wait. Because that six foot eight person that's coming up behind you will tell you what to do. You're not just going to drive off when they pull you over, do you? If you do, you'll be on the news. And it may not be the, <laughs> the part you want to be on. Why do you obey that? Because they're the law. Because it's inside of you to obey because you know the consequences thereof is to disobey and to break the law and go to the pokey. Watch this. Paul is establishing this authority in order for there to be an empowerment for the church. Now I'm going to get to where I want to go. Is this okay? So you must need not only for wrath but also for conscience sake. Talking about the mind. If you can't obey the natural laws, how are you going to obey kingdom laws? If you're rebellious on the roadway, if you're rebellious in life in general, you won't be rebellious in the kingdom. Do you see what he's saying? If you don't respect civil authority, how will you respect divine authority? For for this cause, pay you tribute also that uh, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. So in other words, pay your taxes. I just cussed and some people got mad at me. Pay your taxes. Pay your tithe and pay your taxes. Give unto Caesar what to do to Caesar. Give unto God what to do unto God. What's so hard about that? Well, I don't like where it's going. I don't either. Come on. But try not paying it and you won't like where you go either. It's just that simple. And we've had a lot of people say, well, I'll just rebel against it. But, huh? Number 6759, please come up for your photograph. Come on. I fought the law, but the law won. You ain't going to get away from the long arm of the law. Hey, you know, these people, that get, they go on the, they, they're on the, uh, on the run for 30-something years. They still get them. All right, watch this now. If they don't get them, God will. For this cause, you pay tribute. You do what you're supposed to do. Render therefore all your dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due. Custom to whom custom is due. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. Watch verse 8. Here we get into the nitty-gritty. Owe no man anything but to love one another. So in other words, I'm not going to be obligated in debt to anybody. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do by law and order and by civil authority and the government which God has placed both naturally and supernaturally. And I'm not going to be held responsible or owing in that area because I didn't default or go into debt. But what I do owe is love. In other words, I don't want to owe anybody anything, but what I do want to owe you is everything, and that is love. I owe you love. And God, Paul is trying to get us into this understanding of the kingdom is you pay tribute naturally, you do this naturally, you give honor naturally, but when it comes to my kingdom, your cost is love. Now, we're armed and dangerous. But see, the modern church, again, the American church, especially the American church, we think, again, it, it, it's, it's Davy Crockett, it's bow and arrows, and it's muskets, and all these different things, and we're just going to take this country by force, this world by force, and, and that's not how it's established. See, I don't get a lot of amens because we have that upbringing and that mindset, but I'm going to try to fix that for you. 
For he that loveth another hath fulfilled what? The law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. In other words, if I love... I'm in the divine order of God's government, and therefore I'm not going to do the other things. If I love God and love man, I'm not going to steal from man. I'm not going to take his wife. I'm not help me. I'm not going to steal his his little goat. I'm not going to steal one lace off of his shoe. I'm not going to do anything to harm him because I love him. Do you see the fulfillment of the law? The law of who? The law of God, his structure. I can deal with the civil insanity and do the best I can to change things. But if I follow the law of God, I'm safe in any country of the world. Study history. Study what's happening right now in Iran. One of the greatest, largest movements of God is happening right now in Iran. The Iranian church is on fire and people are getting born again. And guess what? They don't have a bishop. They don't even use fivefold and pastors and these different things. They have leaders. They have people that just step up and start preaching. They're anointed of God. They are Acts chapter 2, part 2. They are the true, authentic, transparent, real church. Not all this fluff we got here, in a sense. They don't have to have the red back hymnal. Or the quarterly magazine from Bishop Tutu? Come on now. They're being led by the Holy Ghost in one of the most oppressive nations of the world. And we have the most freedom in the world. We can't get out of our backyard and help a neighbor. Hey, I don't like you, Pastor. I love you. I'm just trying to help you grow up. I'm just trying to help you get out of the playpen and put on your britches and go out there and do something for Christ. Quit being a baby. I love this. I I just love you guys. You're awesome. Come on now. Watch verse 10. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. See, I'm armed and dangerous. What are you armed and dangerous with? Love. You want to blow people away? Love on them. You want to blow people away that want to do you harm and all? Love on them. Love your enemies. I didn't say be foolish and don't protect yourself and Leave your house unlocked and all the other. I said, love them. Man, I love you. I'm going to show you the love of Christ the best that I possibly can. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the feeling of the law. Verse 11. No, and that, and what? Knowing about love, knowing the time that it is what? High time. Now, the word time there is kairos. What is kairos? Kairos is different than chronos. Chronos, as we've learned, is what? The tick and the tock on your clock. Kairos is in between the tick and the tock. It's a divine opportunity of God, even when the seasons don't look right. So he said it is time or the divine opportunity. It's high time. In other words, he's saying it's a critical season and a critical time for a divine opportunity. See, I think I've outpreached it already. Now you're ready to go to the house. The point is this. It is the time when it is so crucial, when things are the worst, when the things are getting bad, when governments are getting more negative and they're getting more corrupt and society is rotting and all the chaos is spewing into our lives and upon our children and the schools. This is the time and the divine opportunity, the critical hour to show love. To rise up and be who God called us to be under the divine structure of his kingdom. Not to hide out and get bombs and bullets and beanie weenies and Bibles and get in a bunker somewhere and, and shake your boots. Shake inside of your boots, fearful that, oh my gosh, they're going to kill us all. Here comes the commies. Here, com- Here comes this. Here comes that. Honey, bring it on. Whatever is going to be, whatever has been written, we're going to deal with it head on. Because what are you going to do opposite? You ain't going to change prophecy. I can't change prophecy. God's ready to wrap this thing up. He's going to wrap it up. Ain't nothing you can do about it or I can do about it. But I'm going to get in the plan of God 
how I'm going to follow where he's headed. Watch. And that knowing the time, that it is now high time, the hour, the season, this is our time. To do what? To reap the final harvest. But he said it's high time to awake out of sleep. What's he saying to the church? He's saying, get up. Wake up. Not this whole woke culture of feelings getting hurt. But wake up and look what's happening in our world. The hooks are being put in the jaws of nations. They're headed to Armageddon. All of these things are precursors, no matter how long it takes to evolve. One year, ten years, it doesn't make a difference. It's still happening in our lifetime, and we're watching it. What kind of people do we need to be? Armed and dangerous. It's high time. It's harvest time. He said, wake up. Let me give you the Ben, ben Faircloth translation. You ready? Get your B-U-T-T -T up out of bed. And let's go to work. Let's do something. Let's get motivated. Oh, I don't know. This guy. He, he, he. No, you want me. You want a six foot icicle to stand before you and tell you how wonderful you are and so glad that you came in today and threw in your crinkled up dollar bill. You can have your dollar bill back. If you didn't like this message, get your money back. I ain't worried about your money. I want you to do something for Christ. Instead of spending 30, 40, 50 years in the church, come on and do nothing for him. I wish I had friends somewhere. If I could buy a friend right now, I'd give you $100. <laughs> Ronnie's like, I'm here, bro. I'm your buddy. I've always loved you, man. <laughs> Uh, come on now. Trying to love on you, trying to make you laugh, but it's the truth. The church is more worried about the politics of life rather than the policy of Christ and what he's doing, the assignment of God, the great mission, the great commission, and what he wants to do with us. It's time to wake up. Get out of bed. That's one thing I miss about the military. They told me when to get up and when to go to bed. Now I got a wife that does that. Anybody here today? <laughs> Anybody's ever spending time in the military? You know what I'm talking about. Throw them big old steel trash cans in the middle of the hall while you're trying to sleep. How rude awakening that was. But you know what? I got my B-U-T-T -T out of bed. We need some of that today. We need drill sergeants in the house of God. We need people to wake us up, get us out of the, out of the sleep. Come on now. We have too many <laughs> Eucticus, Eucticus, you know, Acts chapter 20, verse 9, when he was, he was in the windowsill. Do you remember that little boy? Eucticus. And Paul was preaching for a long time. Next thing he knew, the guy fell asleep and he fell down. Whoop. Is anybody here? I got too many Eucticuses in the house. Just falling asleep. Watch this. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed, when we first believed. So if our salvation, our redemption draweth nigh, he's saying as you start to see those things, then get yourself out of bed Put on your work clothes, get your work gloves on, and put your hands on the plow and begin to work in the daylight that's been afforded to you. I'm all about work. I said I'm all about kingdom business, 24-7, 365. I don't believe in lazy Christians. In fact, me and lazy Christians, we don't do good together. In fact, lazy folk and natural don't get along with me. Come on now, I believe in resting and sipping on some tea underneath a shady tree once in a while, but to lay there all day? Come on. Or to lay around in church your whole life and never do anything for Well, what am I supposed to do, preacher? Well, go out and pray first. Lay hands on the sick. Go get you free tracks. We got some tracks back there. I'll buy more tracks. If you'll take them, I'll buy more. And stick them everywhere. Stick them in a 12-pack of Budweiser at the store. I don't care. 
put them in one of those gossip, uh, go- gossip tablets or something, you see, when you check out. Come on now. Do something. Put it on a car. Just don't put my name, you know, church's name on it, but do something. I had somebody one time put them on a, in a mailbox somewhere, and the post office called us. I said, I don't know who, who, her name is Sarah, I think. I don't know who did, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, well, it wasn't anybody around here, but I said, I don't know. How do I know? Well, your name is on it. So my name's on a lot of letters. Watch this. For now is our salvation. Read it in context. Read it in context. He said, now is the time. Now it's high time. To do what? To get out of sleep. To get out of slumber. Why? Because our salvation is nearer than when we believed. We are closer now than we were yesterday. If you truly believe that, then what are you doing for Christ? Now, this is when people get all upset and they get emotional. No. No. Seriously, what are you doing? We're headed into March, you all. What have you done for Christ in the last couple months? 23 is going to pass by you. You're going to hit 24, and you still ain't done nothing. Now, I know this is hitting resistance, and I love it because I know I'm preaching, right? Because most of your churches, especially churches in regions like this, most southern churches, if you will, let's put it that way, they want the pastor to do everything. Well, I don't do everything for you because I can't get you saved and keep you saved. I can't get you blessings in heaven. I can lead you to the water, but you got to drink. I can, I can lay the food before you, but you got to eat. You've got to exercise your own salvation, not me. It is not my responsibility to go to church. Uh, see, this, this doctrine's blown up everywhere. Fatted calves falling down. Well, that's what we're paying you for. No, honey, I'm supposed to go to the mountain of God, bring back fresh manna, and bring it to you and be an intercessor like Moses and pray for you and counsel you and love on you and be there for you when you need me and be an example of Christ and tell you to follow me as I follow him. But it is not my job to, to, to do your work. You do the work of the evangelist. I'm doing my own work. I'm going to be judged for all that I'm doing. In fact, I have a higher judgment because I stand before you and I break forth the blessed word of God. You're accountable for hearing me and not doing it. Nah, 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 nah. Right? But you know it's the truth, and, and we expect old pastor to do it. Yeah, we'll get old pastor to do it. No, you do it. You preach this blessed truth. Why? Because it's getting nearer. You get up a little earlier and pray. You pray for yourself. I'll pray for you. I'll lay hands on you. You look like a... <laughs> you'll have so much <laughs> grease on you. you look like a fatted calf, man. Greased down at the county fair. I mean, we'll do whatever we got to do. But you got to do your part. Watch this. Verse 12. I'm leaving in a minute. The night is far spent. It's late, y'all. It's late. Look, I'm not trying to condemn anybody. We're, we're coming up on March. But, but it's dark. The night is going forward. But what are you doing? What's your plans? Now, I'm not talking about losing five ounces next week and all that you're trying to do. I get that. I said that because nobody's going to lose five pounds. You, you, all these little goals. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about what are you going to do for eternity? What are you going to do for Christ? What are you going to do with your life now? This is all you get. Eternity is constantly before my mind. It's constantly in my mind. Why? Because I see the times and I recognize and realize and see the connection between world news and world events and biblical prophecy. And I say, God, I only have so long. I don't want to be a castaway. I don't want to, I don't want to go to heaven and have, have what little bit I bring burnt up. I want it to be gold tried in fire. I want to hear well done, that good and faithful servant. I want to be armed and dangerous in this hour. I want to be armed with the power of love. And do what God has called me to do. And I can't do it in the structure of civil government or natural laws. I got to do it under kingdom principle. 
And the kingdom principle is love. Subjected to his love. He first loved me. I said he first loved me and he first loved you. Then what are we doing with our love? Is the love that we get for Christ, from Christ being born again to be selfish and hold on to it and say, I'm born again? No. You receive your salvation and then you lead others to Christ and say, look what God did for me. Instead of hiding it. I would rather 99% of your conversation be about Christ when you witness than this church. Don't even mention my name. Don't even mention the name of the church. Mention Jesus. Talk about Jesus because you can walk away from that conversation and they go smack dab right into hell knowing the name of my name or the church but never knowing Jesus. Do you see? There's no urgency in the church today anymore. Because we're all worried about politics, worried about what's happening, when the bomb's going to drop, when this is going to happen, 2024, the Calvary's on its way. We're going to change this whole place. You can have it. Now, I'm not saying to give it up and just roll over backwards and let the devil do what he wants to do. But my point is I recognize and realize what time it is. It's high time. It's getting dark. I got to work. If you're a workaholic like my daddy taught me to be in the way he was, you look at the nighttime and you realize it's starting to come. You work harder because you ain't got much longer. And then you know what you do? You go clean up and eat and wash your hands and get ready for the morning because you're ready to go do it again. I love people like that. I, I don't need lounge chair Christians. I need somebody to work. Verse 12, the, I mean, that's why I don't get a lot of help. Watch this. The, the night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Better translation says let's throw it off. Let's throw it off. Why don't we just throw off all this junk we're involved in? Well, I got to do this. I got it. Well, just throw it off. I'm more concerned about my retirement. I'm more concerned about this. I'm more concerned about my future. And I'm more, more concerned. Uh, just cast it off. Cast off unrighteousness, which is the depth of what he's talking about. Cast off the darkness. Just get right with God. If you knew tomorrow you'd be in eternity with God, how would you act today? No, we don't think that way. I got forever. I got 20 years, maybe 30 at the best. No, you don't, you're not promised that. No man's promised tomorrow. I'm, I'm trying to get some fervency inside of you. I'm trying to show you you're armed and dangerous and take that revelation, that reality, and say, man, I only got a short time. I got to work while it's yet light. I got to win somebody to Christ. I got to, I got to see something happen. I, I've got to plan into missions. I've got to give. I got to go if I can. I, I got to do everything I can because I'm armed and I'm dangerous and God needs me. Yes. Instead of just floating around, just so glad you're, you're saved. Well, I'm glad you're saved, man. Woohoo. Now get out of my way. I got to work. Don't you know what I'm talking about? Now I'm going to run you over. I love you, but that plow's fixing to put a nice little dent in your forehead. I love you. No offense. I mean, I used to try to talk to my dad while he worked, and that was the stupidest thing to ever do, because next thing I know, I had a shovel. <laughs> hey, Dad, what's up, bro? What you doing, man? Well, first of all, you didn't call him bro, but hey, Dad, what's up? What are you doing? What do you think I'm doing over here? <laughs> Sweat coming down the I had one of the hey, guys that are mechanics, you know what I'm talking about, but I had one of the biggest problems. I, I, when my dad was working on a car, I would lean on the fender. And so while he's working, it would go down. And then I'd get back up. So you know what I mean? And he'd go back up. <laughs> about want to put a new wrench in my head. He said, son, would you stop? I didn't know what he's doing. I was just trying to look at his work. No, he was working. Come on now. That's what we're doing. We're just laying on the fender. Pastor, how's it going? <laughs> what do you mean, how's it going? I'm trying to take this transmission out of here, man, and you're leaning on the car. Folks, help me now. It's like my wife going to labor and you're breathing Cheetos. And you okay? Doritos, whatever. Watch this. Therefore, cast off the works of darkness and let us put on what? The armor of light. 
I am armed and dangerous with what? Light, with the love of Christ. With the brightness of his glory and the brightness of his goodness. And that isn't just me because I'm a preacher. It's you. You have armor of life. You take off the darkness. You get away from the little sins that easily beset you. You get away from the habits and the thought patterns. And it could be even major like pornography or whatever. You get away. You cast off darkness. I'm not going to follow the way of the world. I'm not going to sit there and YouTube it all day. And follow this and follow that. I'm going to put on the armor of light because I'm armed and I'm dangerous for God. Watch, I'm closing, I'm closing. I don't want to. I do this all day long. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly. Come on now. Let us walk honestly between who? You and God and God and man. Let us be honest. Let's be sincere as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness. I need another hour to preach this because we think this is the, he's not talking to the sinner. <laughs> this isn't to the sinner. This ain't why no Joe underneath the overpass. That's the house of God. He's literally dealing with church folk. Rioting. What are they talking about? party in every time you see him it's a party come on no plowing partying no plowing parading showing everything that god's done yeah look at god's done you see his new pants man look at god's done got a new car got a new boat got a new 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 everything's just just showing off what you got instead of showing off what he has and what he's doing in your life through bringing people to christ and showing some fruit You know I'm telling you the truth. It's exactly the way we are. Not rioting and drunkenness. Really? Talking about church folk? Yeah. You wouldn't be be surprised how many folks in the church are drunk. Who drink. Yeah, I knew he was an old fire raptor preacher. I knew he was going to. No. Come on now. One of the biggest addictions in the, in, the, in the house of God is medical, is prescribed drugs. I'm not talking about stuff you need for your body. I'm talking about stuff to make you happy, sad, and glad, and sideways, and upways, and down, whatever. It is the truth. You can read the statistics on it. And I'm not against anybody taking anything they need to, to live in the medical part of that. I'm just talking about the life that was, I got to have a little beer. Got some beer, Pastor. Got some beer. I got to have some whiskey, got to have some wine, got to have a wine cooler, got to have some Boone Farm. If you like drink and vomit, that's between you and God. But I'm going to tell you, you'll stand before a holy God someday. Get out of the drunkenness. Get away from the stuff to cast all the stuff of the world off. What is so hard about this? I don't, I don't get it. When I got saved, he took me out of all that craziness. And it was crazy. He delivered me as he delivered you. Why do you want to be like a dog and go back to your vomit? I don't. I don't appreciate seeing that happen in the natural anyways. Somebody somebody needs to help me close this thing. It is the absolute truth. Why do you want to be in it? Not in in, in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy. In other words, you're just fighting and gossiping. You're mad about everything. But here's the close. But put you on the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, how do I put him on? His character. What would Jesus do? How would Jesus act? If Jesus was on the earth right now, where would he be? I will tell you where he would be. Where he was in the Bible. With the poor. With the sinner. With the tax collector. With the bums. With the prostitutes, with the adulterers. Come on. He would be where he's supposed to be, leading them to himself. But we hide away in these ivory towers and these crystal cathedrals, and we get ourselves so full of, 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 of the pride of who we are and that we're saved, we don't do nothing with it. Yeah, see, I just, I'm out of time. 
And you, somebody said, well, he's being harsh. I'm not being harsh. I'm trying to provoke you to do good works. I'm trying to let you see you are armed and dangerous. You go to the dark places. When is the last time? For all of us, have we witnessed to somebody? Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. What would he be doing, body of Christ? He would be going house to house breaking bread. Fellowshipping, loving, interceding, and most of all, he'd be giving his life. See, Jesus didn't give his life just on the cross of Calvary. Do you know that? He died long before he got on the cross when he did the will of God and followed the plan. He died what? Daily. And that's what we're supposed to do. That's what this message is about, is dying daily. I'm armed. You're armed. Armed to what? The armor of light. We have the power of God. We have his love. Then we got to go do something with it. Put all ye on the, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make to, no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. If you put on Christ, you won't be flipping and tripping and doing all you're doing and going after the things of the world, man. You'll be pursuing Christ. You'll be doing everything you can with the breath you have in your life. I think we're going to get to heaven one day. We're going to say, man, I could have. I'm going to tell you right now, you should have. Now is your time. While it's yet light, this is the opportunity to do it. If you're watching me right now and you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, today's the day to make it right. He loves you with an amazing love. You may not understand all the churchy words that we've said today, but just know this. It's L-O-V-E. Jesus loves you so much that he died for you. He wants you to be with him forever. All you got to do is accept him into your heart. If you're backslidden, if this message has affected you, come on, let's get it right with God. You're armed, you're dangerous, and the world needs you to put on Christ and preach this truth to the whole world. Father, thank you for your amazing grace and love. We bless you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.